This is Electrician Program, Chapters 17 and 18. Chapter 17, Telephone and Computer Network Wiring. And Chapter 18 is the All Important Motor Wiring. Chapter 17, Telephone and Computer Network Wiring. Some of the objectives in this chapter are to understand the telephone system from the central office to the telephone that's in a residential home. Troubleshoot a telephone wiring system. Know which cables are used in most residential computer networks. Install telephone and computer cabling in a new and existing home or house. And terminate telephone cabling. Some of the technical terms encountered are cable pair, cable run, cable termination box, central office, or central office, crosstalk, local loop, patch cable, protector, telephone wall plate, and terminal block. Wiring a home for telephone service and connecting computers with a network were two jobs that used to be handled by technicians who specialized in those tasks. Today the electrician is often called on to install these systems. These are skills that, while not an essential in electrical wiring, will make you a more valuable employee to an electrical company that includes computer network and telephone cabling in new home construction. System Overview These topics have been combined into one chapter because the telephone and network wiring often share the same devices, tools, and installation procedures. In fact, some systems have discarded the traditional phone system entirely, opting to carry voice signals over the internet. Telephone. Telephone service receives its power from a local telephone exchange called the central office. The telephone connection from the building to the central office is called the local loop. Telephone conductors or lines are actually two cables or, or two wires called a cable pair. At the central office, the wires are connected to a powered battery that supplies direct current to operate the telephone equipment. As shown in figure 17-1, distribution lines can be run overhead on poles or buried in the ground, many cable pairs are bundled together in large cables to carry telephone service to area customers. A cable termination box is the enclosure where the connections are made for the cable pair coming from each building. It is found in both above ground and below ground installations. Cable pairs from the building actually terminate at a protector. This is a device that protects the cable pair from high voltage should lightning strike the wires. From the single protector, the cable pair enters the building. They may go directly through the wall, feed through a roof overhang, soffit or rake into an attic, through a wall into a basement. The cable pair usually the cable pair usually connects to a terminal block or network interface device inside of the building. The terminal block is the junction point for all of the telephones in the building. It is also called a 42A block, a modular interface or a modular outlet. All wires, pairs or all wire pairs for each phone are connect, can connect to this terminal. Computer network. Network wiring is the infrastructure of a network. A network allows personal computers or PCs to share resources such as files and printers and to share a common internet access device. Although PCs are often networked to share files and printers, they are typically networked to share a common internet access device. 
Residential networks can use various types of network media such as copper core cable, radio frequency or wireless, existing phone lines and existing power lines. This chapter focuses only on copper core cable networks, specifically those that use twisted pair cable. Installation, although a high degree of experience is not required to install phone and computer network cabling, the, important, the importance of professional, robust, and accurate installation is no less than any other job that you may perform. The phone system is a critical system in a medical or fire emergency. Also, the time and expense of a callback because of sloppiness may erode any profit or reputation you developed on that job. Safety, there is a little danger of electrical shock from telephone's own voltage. When the unit is not ringing, 48 volts DC is present. Operating the phone signal requires 85 to 90 volts AC. This voltage AC and DC is supplied by the telephone company. To avoid any shocks, take the receiver off the hook when working on the system. Regardless of the lower voltages in telephone systems, it is advisable to avoid the possibility of shock by taking these precautions. Be sure that the inside wiring is not hooked to the network interface. This ensures there is no power in the system. If for some reason this cannot be done, use screwdrivers, cutters and strippers with insulated handles very preferable they be high voltage insulation. Avoid touching screw terminals or bare conductors with your hands. Use care in drilling through walls, floors or ceilings. Avoid areas where there may be electrical wiring, gas pipes, steam pipes or water pipes. When working on existing telephone wiring disconnect any transformer that might be supplying step down voltage for dial lightning or for dial lighting. Keep the cell phone and network wiring at least two feet away from power circuits in the building. To avoid high voltage shock, keep telephone cable pairs away from accidental contact with 120 or 240 line current. Never remove protectors or grounding means placed by the telephone company. Do not modify these installations to make any connection to them. Keep jacks away from locations such as tubs, showers, swimming pools, and laundry areas. Corded telephones should not be used where the body will be in touch with water. Tools. There are several tools such as crimpers that are designed exclusively for terminating phone and computer network cabling. You will need to use or you will need these to attach an RJ11 or RJ45 plug into a twisted pair cable. However, most of the installation can be, can be accomplished using some of the basic tools that every electrician should have in their pouch. Cable types. The type of cable you select will depend on the purpose and environment of the finished installation. Always think of the future of any of the future use of any cabling when comparing its performance and cost. Telephone cable. Cabling that is designed for telephone use can be divided into indoor and outdoor cable. The indoor cable will be used more than the outdoor cable since the phone company will probably run the phone line all the way to the house. There are three types of indoor cable, flat, quad, and twisted pair. Again, that's flat, quad, and twisted pair. Flat cable is generally used to connect the telephone to the wall outlet. This cable is terminated with a plug on each end. Therefore, you must buy a, the flat cable in the length required. There are usually two conductors, but some flat cables contain four. See figure 17-4. Quad cable contains four wires, usually solid, that are bundled together so that they are parallel to each other. This is the lowest grade of cable for telephone systems. However, it has been used reliably in many houses for many years. To 
twisted cable contains three pairs of wires with each pair twisted together. The six wires are covered in a jacket for protection. Twisted pair is a better performing cable for reasons you will learn about in the following section. Twisted pair cable. Twisted pair cable for computer networks contains four twisted pairs of computer conductors. See figure 17-5. Twisting the conductors in each pair helps to reduce crosstalk. Crosstalk is the phenomenon of a current carrying conductor imposing an electrical signal on another conductor. When electrical energy passes through a wire, an, electrical, an electromagnetic field is created around the wire. A current carrying conductor placed in parallel and in close proximity to another conductor can induce current flow in the other conductor. Twisting the conductors produces crosstalk reduces crosstalk by minimizing the amount of parallel contact between the conductors. An outer jacket cover all or an outer jacket covers all four pairs. The conductors in each pair are color coded. Notice that there is an orange pair, green pair, blue pair and brown pair. Within each pair, one of the conductors is a solid color and the other is striped. The color coding plays a role in proper wiring. There are two general types of twisted pair cables, shielded twisted pair or STP and unshielded twisted pair UTP. STP has a metallic shield beneath its outer jacket. Some STP cable also shields each twisted pair. UTP does not have a shield. This is the cable that you will use in most telephone and computer installations. There are seven categories of twisted pair cable, category one through category 7. The categories differ in characteristics such as number of twists per foot, wire size, and the rated frequency cap cap capacity of the conductors. Category 5 or category 5E and category 6 are typically used for residential networks. Professional tip, cat watt. Twisted pair cabling is often referred to by its category designation. If your supervisor said run some CAT 5E from here to all of the bedrooms, you should install a cable run of category 5 EUTP cabling from your current location in the house to each bedroom. Twisted pair cable is available in on a spool or in real inbox CAT packaging. Real in box packaging makes it easy for one person to run cabling and keep the cable from kicking or kinking and nodding. Using only a spool of cable would require two people for the installation, one to pull the cable and the other to unwind the cable by hand. An alternative is to insert a rod through the spool and have one person hold the ends of the rod while the other person pulls the cable. A patch cable is a length of twisted pair cable that is unterminated on each end with a RJ45 plug. A patch cable is used for connections between a network device and a computer. Patch cables are available, available for purchase in various lengths and cable types such as category 5E UTP. Patch cables can also be made by hand with the appropriate tools. Making patch cables is rarely an electrician's task. Cable installation. These rules should be followed when running cable. Do not exceed the pull tension of the cable type. Do not bend cables less than the established minimum bend radius of that cable type. Do not cinch bundled cables too tightly. Use proper wire hangers or straps to secure wire. Do not secure wires with plain staples. Keep cables away from devices that can cause interference. When a cable run must be, must be parallel to electrical wiring, there should be at least five inches of space between them. When a cable must cross electrical wiring, it should do so at a 90, at a 90, 90 degree angle. Or perpendicular. 
leaves 6 inches to 8 inches of extra wire at each cable end and do not exceed maximum home run cable lengths. Finally keep future upgrades and service changes in mind. The pull intention of UTP cable is 25 pounds and the pull intention of coaxial cable is 35 pounds. Exceeding the pull intention of either cable can cause physical damage and reduce the quality of the electrical signal. A cable bent should not be less than the established minimum bend radius. Doing so will degrade the quality of the electrical signal. The minimum bend radius is usually four times the overall diameter of the cable. But be sure to follow the manufacturer's recommendations. See figure 17-6. There may be many products available for securing wire bundles such as hook and loop straps and cable ties. Do not cinch these too tight or the insulation may be damaged. Cables should be at least six inches away from devices that can cause electromagnetic interference or EMI. This includes fluorescent lighting, motors, and electrical wiring. When a cable crosses over electrical wiring, it should not it should cross at a 90 degree angle. This prevents the development of crosstalk. When cable when running cable, always leave an extra six to eight inches of wire at each end of the run. This will allow for ample cable in case the original termination becomes damaged. Also, do not exceed the maximum cable lengths for each home run. The home run for category five and higher cabling should not exceed 295 feet. RG RG59 has a maximum home run of 656 feet and RG6 has a maximum home run of 886 feet. Remember satellite and digital cable services uses only RG6 whereas broadband cable can use either RG6 or RG59. The RG6 cable should be quad shielded and be able to support a bandwidth of at least 1.8 megahertz. Conduit. Installing conduit is a smart precaution against having obsolete cabling. Electrical and telephone wiring has not changed dramatically within the past few decades. However, manufacturers of computer cabling have consistently developed better performing conductors every few years. Replacing cables is much easier when conduit is installed. Electrical non-metallic tubing. You learned about electrical non-metallic tubing ENT in chapter 4 wiring systems. This conduit is typically a corrugated tube with snap-on fittings. Installation requires few tools and limited skills. See figure 17-7. Also this type of conduit is available in different colors that help identify the purpose for the cabling inside. Electrical metallic tubing for installations that require a stronger conduit or need to guard against electromagnetic interference, use electrical metallic tubing (EMT). Although the installation is more complex than ENT, at this point you should be able to cut, bend, and install EMT fairly quickly. Boxes. Some installers may use standard electrical boxes for termination points. This may be convenient to use a new construction but are not necessary. There are boxes designed for these low voltage situations. See figure 17-8 face plates with connectors are mounted directly on these boxes. In new construction the telephone wiring should be installed before the application of drywall or paneling. In start, start the wiring at the connection installed near the network interface if the outlet boxes are required by local code the, or be sure to allow them to extend beyond the stud, the thickness of the wall covering materials. Fasten the telephone wire to a stud only if needed 
to maintain space between the telephone wire and any electrical wire. Allow 6 inches of wire inside of the outlets for your connections. Locations It is typically recommended that kitchen and bedrooms have at least two service locations and that the living room, family room and office have at least three service locations. The faceplate face plate and jack used will depend on the need or the needed service or services. See figure 17-9. Jacks and connectors are modular and can be snapped onto any of the available openings in the wall plate. For new home installations, the TIA EI, EIA 570A standard recommends up to recommends two UTP category 5 or category 5E and two RG6 cables be run to each service location. One UTP cable can be used for a network connection and be and the other for a telephone connection. One RG6 cable can serve as a cable TV or CAT TV CATV connection and the other as a broadland cable internet access connection or a satellite internet access connection. The jack or connector must match the cable type. For example, if the cable run is category 6, a category 6 jack must be installed. If the cable run is RG6, a RG6 connector must be installed, etc. Installing cable in an existing home. Installing telephone systems up through wall coverings are in place entails more cable, more care, and usually more work. This is especially true when wiring is to be concealed. In these cases, use of fish tape and string will help us will help pull wires through wall cavities. Refer to chapter 10 elect electrical remodeling for information on pulling wires through existing construction. Wires cannot always be run inside walls, they are often mounted on surfaces. Such wire must be supported. Use a quarter inch wide staples made from made for supporting telephone wire. Insulated staples work well to protect the wire. Ordinary staples are not recommended because they easily damage the insulation on the telephone wire. Do not run the wire under carpeting. Or near traffic areas. Wires can be made less notable, noticeable if they are placed in areas where moldings, casings, grooves, in paneling, or coverings partially or wholly conceal them. Wiring also can be run inside cabinets. Terminating cables. Terminal and cable pairs are color-coded in four wire cable. The wire colors are usually black, green, red, and yellow. Terminal screws are coated accordingly. Most blocks allow you to run cable pairs for as many as four phones. A cable run is a long length of cable that is typically pulled through walls and the ceiling area. One end of a cable run is terminated at a centrally located patch panel and the other end is terminated at the RJ45 wall jack connector. Devices, terminal blocks should be attached to ceiling or floor joists in the attic or basement. When attaching cable pairs, leave some slack so the wires will not pull loose from the block. A plug is attached to the end of the telephone or network cable allow the cable to be easily connected to or disconnected from a system. The standard plugs are RJ40, RJ11 for telephone and RJ45 for computer networks. A special crimper is required to attach a plug to a cable. See figure 17-10. The plug on a cable is inserted into a jack. A jack is attached to the system cabling and is usually mounted on a wall to allow convenient place a convenient place to attach a telephone or computer. As with electrical wiring, a faceplate for telephone and network wiring hides the cabling and exposed terminations. The faceplate may also support the jack. 
A telephone wall plate is a special face plate that has two mounting pegs that fit the slots on the mounting base of a wall mounted telephone. Wall phone outlets should be about 60, no, 56 inches from the bottom of the outlets to the floor. Over counters allow 10 inches between the bottom of the outlets and the countertop. The pins may be used as ground. If you change the plates, you may need to connect a ground wire to the pins. Other systems. There are systems other than those covered in this chapter that may be installed by electricians. For now, they are not prevalent enough to justify explanation beyond these instructions below. Product costs, installation complexity, and performance are the reasons these systems are not as popular as copper cabling. Ethernet and plain old telephone services or POTS equipment, fiber optic, fiber optic cable is clear glass or plastic conductor that transmits light signals, fiber optic cables outside appearance is very similar to copper cable, only the markings on the outer jacket and the ends of the cable reveal the fragile interior as fiber. fiber optic cable is unaffected by electromagnetic interference and transmits signals very quickly. The cost of the cable and ICs and termination equipment have kept fiber cable out of most networked homes. This will probably change as the cost decreases. Structured cable or structured cabling. There are companies that sell cable management products that work together as a system to protect, manage, and identify all of the non-electrical cabling in the home. This system is called structured cabling, includes panels, boxes, conduit, and termination devices for the phone, computer network, video, and security cabling in a home. Since these systems are unique to each manufacturer, it is best to rely on the installation instructor, instructions and support personnel for the proper installation methods. Connecting the components of these systems is made easier with a composite cable. Composite cable contains coaxial, twisted pair, and sometimes fiber optic cables into one bundle. For this see figure 17-12. This bundle is run from a central point in the house to each room that requires a computer, telephone, or video connection. Wireless. Adding a computer network to an existing home has always required fishing cables in walls or hiding the cables in surface mount raceways. There are products out now that transmit the computer signals using radio frequency that do not need any cabling between the computers. These products include NICs or NICs, routers, and even printers. The performance is less than cable networks, but not less than most people's needs. Installation is fairly easy and does not require the skills of an electrician. Satellite and cable television. These systems bring a television signal into a, the home from an orbiting satellite or from a coaxial cable that is buried or overhead. The companies that sell these systems have their own trained technicians who handle all aspects of the installation. Moving on to the review questions for this chapter, chapter 17. Question 1. The two conductors used to connect a telephone to a system are called twisted pair cable. Question 2. True or false. The terminal block can connect all lines in a house to the telephone system. And that is true. Question 3. True or false. The telephone system in a house must be connected to the electrical system. And that is true in a way the telephone system must be bonded with the ground 
or grounding system in the house or the grounding system of the electrical system but the telephone system does not need to be electrically connected to the electrical system question four the wires are twisted in twisted pair cabling to prevent crosstalk question five the selecting conduit or when selecting conduit for a telephone and network cabling which type requires the fewest tools time and skill that would be ENT question six which installation does the TIA EIA 570A standard recommend for each service location the correct answer is C two cat 5 UTP cables and two RG6 cables now the know the code section question one which section contains an exception that removes conduit field restrictions from raceways for communication wires and cables and that would be section 800.48 found in page 70-593 of the 2002 NEC Question 2 according to section 800.133 A 1 how many types of cable are allowed to be in the same raceway as communication cables and the answer is 5 for this see page 1271 of the NEC handbook 12th edition which is based on the NEC 2011 Now moving on to the all important chapter of motors, chapter 18, objectives. Interpret data contained on the name plates of an electric motor. Determine permissible voltage drop for an electric motor. And properly size circuit conductors for various motor lo and loads. Now the steps for mounting a motor and connecting it to a load. And discuss the proper procedure for service and repair of motors. Technical terms discuss, discussed here are continuous duty, frame number, and limited duty. Electricians must be familiar with the wiring requirements of electric motors. They also need to know how to order the right replacement when an old motor is no longer serviceable. Motors operating at 600 volts or less are encountered frequently motors with higher voltages are found in larger commercial and industrial operations types of motors there are several different types of motors based on the method of operation and design these include DC motors single phase AC squirrel cage motors polyphase AC motors wound rotor three phase motors and synchronous motors Although the specific characteristics of these motors are beyond the scope of this book, electricians dealing with motors operated machinery will require considerable study and hands-on training before they are able to wire, repair, and maintain motors. The information in this chapter is, in, is general and introductory in nature. Articles 430 and 440 of the National Electric Code should be reviewed carefully before you attempt any install with uh, motors before you attempt to install any motors and its associated circuit components these NEC articles deal with many concerns and variations of motor circuits the motor nameplates one of the most important aids to installing and wiring a motor correctly is the information found on the motor itself the nameplates which provides a wealth of data regarding the characteristics of the motor. The NEC and NEMA, the National Electrical Manufacturer Association, requirements state that all motors are to have nameplates providing the following information name of manufacturer, horsepower rating, type, frame number, frame, uh, excuse me, time rating, RPM rating, design letter, frequency in hertz, number of faces 
installation class, load rating in amperes, locked rotor code letter, voltage, duty, ambient temperature, and service factor. Other information such as serial number, model number, and bearing numbers are if efficient and efficiency ratings are often also included. This nameplate data should be carefully reviewed before setting a and wiring a motor. Some nameplate data definitions. The frame and type. The NEMA designation for frame designation and type. Horsepower. It is the power rating of the motor. Motor code is designated by a letter indi indicating the starting current required. The higher the locked rotor kilovolt amper, KVA, the higher the starting current surge. Cycles in hertz, which is the frequency at which the motor is designed to be operated. The face, the number of faces on which the motor operates. Revolutions per minute, RPM, the speed of the motor at full load. The voltage, which is the voltage or voltages of operation. Thermal protection, which is an indication of thermal protection provided for the motor, if it has any. The amps or amperage, the rated current in amperes at full load. The time, which is the time rating of the motor showing the duty rating as continuous or a specific period of time the motor can be operated. Ambient temperature or temperature rise is the maximum ambient temperature at which the motor should be operated or the permissible temperature rise of the motor above the ambient air at rated load. The service factor, the amount of overload that the motor can tolerate on a continuous basis at rated voltage and frequency. Installation class a designation of insulation system used included primarily for convenience in rewinding. And finally the NEMA design, the letter designation for specifying the motor characteristics. Frame number. Motors of a given horsepower rating are built in a certain size of frame or housing. For standardization NEMA has assigned a frame number to the frame size for each integral horse power motor. This ensures that the shaft heights and dimensions are consistent for motors that are designed a specific frame number. Proper size of motor feeder conductors. For proper operation of an electric motor, the supply voltage and frequency cycles per second or hertz at the motor terminals must match the values specified by the manufacturer as closely as possible. The performance is best over a range or of plus or minus 10% of rated voltage and 5% above or below, or below rated frequency. Frequency is usually not a problem since it rarely varies. However, if applied voltage varies too much from the nameplate specifications, it will produce noticeable changes in the motor torque or turning force. A low voltage from inadequate wiring or any other can cause or create severe problems. Motor starting torque may be too low to start the load and keep it moving. The following sections describe and demonstrate how to size wire properly. Amper adjustments and correction factors. You learned that the size of a conductor is based on the current rating of the OCPD or the overcurrent protection device and may increase if an adjustment factor or a correction factor is required. The adjustment factor is determined by the number of conductors in a raceway or cable and the correction factor is based on the ambient temperature. 
motor circuits must include an additional factor to handle the increased load as the motor starts. Article 430, Section 2 describes the situations where a conductor and passity would have to be changed. For most AC installations, the ampacity requirement for a motor or the ampacity requirement of a motor is 125% of the motor's full load current rating. Again, for most AC motor installations, the ampacity requirement of a motor is 125% of the motor's full load current rating. The nameplate should show the full load current rating. But if it does not, refer to table 430.250 of the NEC. For example, the circuit conductors supplying a 30 horsepower, 460 volt, three phase wound rotor motor are found as follows. These steps are on the screen. Step one, from the NEC table 430.250, the full load current rating is shown to be 40 amps. Step two, the branch circuit conductors for continuous safe operation must be 120% of, of this rating or 50 amp. Step three, thus the conductors for this circuit must be no smaller than 6AWG copper, THW, RHW, THHN, RHH, or TW, as shown in table 310.15B. 16 of the NEC. When aluminum circuit conductors are used for AWG types TW, TH, W, RHH, THHN, or XHHW would be suitable. Again, refer to NEC Table 310.15B16. Voltage drop. Voltage drop, as you can recall, is the reduction in voltage along the length of a conductor. It is, again, the reduction in voltage along the length of the conductor. This is important to know when you have to wire a circuit for a motor because voltage drop greatly affects the speed and torque of a motor. As specified by NEMA, Motors are designed to handle a 10% fluctuation in voltage above and below the rating on the nameplate. You may not be able to control the typical voltage changes that occur as loads are placed on and off the electrical system, but you can control the amount of voltage drop by installing the proper conductors. Refer to figure 18-2 as you determine the proper conductors to install in this example shown on the screen. Step 1. The NEC requires this motor to be supplied by branch circuit conductors having a capacity of 125% of the full load current or 20 amps. So we multiply as you can see 1.25 times 20 which is 25 amps. So the copper conductors that are 10 AWG or larger would be required to handle the amperage. Step two, the motor is rated at 230 volts. Find the amount of voltage drop that the motor can tolerate. So we have 230 volts uh, times 10% or times 0.1 which is the same as 10%, which gives you 23 volts. Step three, when the full load current of 20 amps is flowing, find the maximum resistance allowed. So for that, we divide 23 volts divided by 20 amps. 23 divided 20 equals 1.15, and that is in ohms. Step four, this is the maximum resistance for is this maximum resistance is for two wires. So to find the maximum resistance for one wire, we just divide the values in ohms by two. 
in this case 1.15 ohms divided by 2 equals point zero, point 0.575 again point 0.575 ohms step 5 find the maximum resistance allowed for each foot of wire in this case we have 0.575 ohms divided by 500 feet which gives us 0.00115 ohms per foot so we're using a length of 500 odd because the example shows 300 but that's what the text says 500 we'll go with that for now step 6 the table lists the resistance of conductors in ohms per 1000 feet or every 1000 foot so we have to find out what is it uh, the resistance per 1000 foot for that we multiply 0 0.00115 ohms times a thousand foot which gives us 1.15 ohms per 1000 foot step 7 use table 8 of the NEC which lists the resistance of solid 10 AWG conductor which is 1.21 ohms per thousand foot this resistance is more than the 1.15 that is allowed so the next larger size solid 8 AWG has a resistance of 0.764 ohms per thousand foot so this example illustrates that although the table 310.15b16 allows a 10 AWG conductor for the 25 amp adjusted motor circuit the voltage drop requires a larger conductor which is the 8 AWG the resistance or the resistances used for the foregoing in the foregoing example are based on the ambient temperature of 167 degrees Fahrenheit that is 75 degrees Celsius or centigrade higher temperatures will create higher conductor resistance and consequently higher voltage drops see notes at the bottom of the NEC chapter 9 table 8 to make any necessary adjustments protection of motor feeder conductors the protection of motor feeder conductors rests primarily on the type of motor circuit involved for practical per practical purposes there are four common motor circuits single motor circuit as you can see on the screen this circuit serves only one motor multiple motor circuit this circuit serves two or more motors motors or motor and other load circuit a circuit that serves one or more motors in addition to other loads such as lighting and appliances and hermetic compressor motor circuit this circuit serves one or more or medically sealed air conditioner compressor motors circuit protection protection for a motor circuit is provided by an overload relay within the motor starter and with an adequate fuse or circuit breaker at the panel the overload protection is in the starter must have a rating that is not more than 125 percent of the motors full load current fusing or circuit breaker requirements are found in section 430.52 of the NEC the maximum fuse or breaker size permitted for short circuit or ground fault protection is 150 percent of the full load current rating for example, look at figure 18-4 on the left side of the screen. Note that the procedure for determining conductor size and the protection is the same as for the larger motor used in our previous example. It makes no difference that the motor type and supply voltage are different. Dual 
element fuses. Dual element fuses are designed mainly for motor circuit protection. The fuse blows and opens the circuit when either of two elements inside opens. This occurs during the following circuit faults. Overloads, as you can see on the right side of the screen. A time delay element made from an alloy melts to open the circuit. Short circuits, links on either side of or ends of the fuse blow in a fraction of an alternating current cycle. Dual element fuses have several advantages over single element fuses. First, they may be used or selected to closely match the actual motor running because they do not have or they do not blow on, on harmless momentary overloads. Therefore, it is less of a nuisance blowing. And their low let through current prevents the faults current from reaching destructive levels. In the more vulnerable branch circuits and associated equipment, this would be less possible with ordinary single element fuses or where more costly fuses are not justified. Also, they can be more closely matched to the protective wiring and equipment because they are not subject to nuisance blowing. Therefore, the equipment used can be more compact and less expensive. Finally, they are ideally suited for the protection of coils, relays, relays, solenoids, and other magnetic equipment because the time delay element will not blow on a momentary inrush of current. Yet, they will blow if the overload is sustained. General layout. Figure 18-5 that is on the left side of the screen shows the general layout acceptable for a single motor branch circuit this circuit must provide conductors rated at 125 percent of the motor full load current top right of the screen circuit overcurrent protection in the form of fuses or breakers a motor controller with overload protection and a means of disconnect General Purpose Circuit Guide Follow these general guidelines First, when, a, when each motor is 1 horsepower or 6 amps or less this circuit re will require 20 amps, 125 volts or smaller fuse or breaker or a 10 amp, 250 volts For this, see figure 18-6 which is on the middle of the screen top Second, large motors require a controller and overcurrent protection that is approved for group installation. Third, cord and plug connection is permitted. A 15 amp circuit with fuse or circuit brake protection is suitable for motors one third horsepower or less. For this, see figure 18 7, middle bottom of the screen. motor branch circuit each motor needs motor running over current protection this protection must not exceed the amperage stamped on the OCPD of the smallest motor on the branch circuit the OCPD must be approved for group installation in multiple motor circuits each motor may have an individual disconnect, but it is not necessary. A single disconnect for a group of motors is permitted if all of the motors are parts of one machine. The disconnect, the disconnect is in sight of all of the motors 
and each motor is 6 amps or less and less than 300 volts. Conductors supplying two or more motors must have a current rating not less than 125% of the full load currents rating of the largest motor plus the sum of the full load current rating of the other motors on the circuit. Controller requirements. Motors must be provided with some type of control. The NEC defines a motor controller as a switch or other device normally used for starting and stopping a motor. The controller must be protected against short circuit currents or current damage, short circuit current damage. There are numerous options available to meet the requirements. The method used depends primarily on the size and type of motor. Control methods. On small single phase motors, the OCPD may serve as the controller for motors that are rated not more than 1 8 horsepower, stationary and normally left running. For this see figure 18-8. A good example would be a clock motor for motors up to and including 2 horsepower the controller may be a switch this switch should be of the general use type and have a current capacity of at least twice the full load current rating of the motor the switch may also serve as a disconnect for this see figure 18-9 top of the screen which shows a suitable switch. The circuit breaker for a branch circuit may serve as a controller. However, the longer delay prior to opening may permit a fault current damage, may permit a fault current to damage the controller or the motor. The circuit breaker may also serve as the disconnect. A cord and plug arrangement may serve as a controller for motors at less than one-third horsepower. Figure 18-10. The same arrangement may also serve as a disconnect. Sealed Hermetic Motors. Motors that are hermetically sealed inside a refrigerating or air conditioning system have low operating temperatures and stay cool during normal operation. They can handle heavier loads than general purpose motors because of this temperature advantage. Such motors are not rated in horsepowers, but in terms of full load currents, locked rotor current, or both. Controller selection is often determined from NEC tables 430.247 through 430.251b by checking the horsepower equivalent. Tables 430.251a and b will give you the horsepower equivalent for locked rotor current ratings. The larger of the two values derived from the tables should be used to find the controller rating. Of course, the nameplate provides full load and locked rotor current ratings. If exact current values are not given in the charts, then go to the next higher current in the table to find the horsepower rating. Some controllers are rated in full load current or locked rotor current. In such cases, the horsepower equivalent is not needed. Sample problem. For example, 
what is the correct size of the controller for a 230 volt three phase wound rotor motor that has a nameplate showing a 90 amp locked rotor and full load current of 25.3 amps. Find the full load current and 90 amp locked rotor current of this motor. Step one would be to find the full load amperage from table 430.250. The next full load amperage above 25.3 is 28. This indicates a horsepower equivalent of 10. The next higher locked rotor amperage shown in table 430.251B is 92. This indicates a 5 horsepower equivalent. Since the higher HP value is to be used, the controller must be rated for 10 horsepower. Motor duty. Motor design and motor design has an influence on the capacities of the controller and fuses used with a motor. All electric motors are designed for either continuous or limited duty. Motors designed for continuous duty will deliver the rated horsepower for an indefinite period without overheating. General purpose motors should always be continuous duty type. Limited duty motors will deliver rated horsepower for a specific a specified period of time but cannot be operated continuously at the rated load. A limited duty motor is one used to operate valves, pumps or elevators. If it is operating if its operating period is extended, a limited duty motor will overheat and may burn out prematurely. Selecting proper size disconnect. Before discussing the proper disconnect in sizing we must define first define a few terms related excuse me rated load current is the first term the current resulting when a motor is operated at the late at the rated row uh, rated load rated voltage and rated frequency of the equipment it serves the rated load current is indicated on the name plates of the motor. Second term is branch circuit selection current. The value in amperes to be used instead of the rated load current to determine the size of the branch circuit conductor. Disconnecting means, controller ratings and default device ratings. This value is always greater than the rated load current. The disconnecting means rating for a hermetic motor shall be 115%, again 115% of the nameplate rated load current, or the branch circuit selection current, whichever is greater. The equivalent horsepower is determined in the same way as described earlier for determining controller horsepower. Again, the larger value is the one used to select the proper disconnect. Sizing circuit components for combination loads. The circuit shown in figure 18-11 includes two 1.5 horsepower, one 7.5 horsepower and one 10 horsepower squirrel cage motors plus a lighting load of 26,000 VAs. The supply consists of a four wire three phase 230 volt delta transformer. In order to properly install this circuit we must determine, shown on the right side of the screen, conductor opacities, conductor types and sizes, conduit sizes and fill, switch requirements and sizes, and OCPD capacities. Using the step-by-step -step method the procedures that follow illustrate how to find the values needed. Every electrician should master this step-by-step -step procedure because it is quick and practical. Furthermore, the method 
can be applied to many power lighting combination circuits. Step 1 from the NEC table 430.150 determine the full load current for each motor. For the 1.5 power we have 6 amps for the 7.5 horsepower we have 22 amps and for the 10 horsepower we have 28 amps. Step 2 calculate the main motor feeder capacity and conductor size. For this refer to NEC section 430.24 and we have two at uh, for the one and a half horsepower at six amps. We have twelve amps. One we have for the seven and a half horsepower at twenty-two amps. We have twenty-two amps. And one times the ten horsepower at twenty-five amps times one hundred and twenty-five percent we have 35 amps. This is the largest motor so we have a total of 69 amps. So 3 6 AWG copper conductors type THHN again from NEC table 310.16 will work well. These should be installed with 1 inch conduit. See the NEC Annex C table C1 for that. Step 3. Find the motor feeder protection rating. Refer to NEC sections 430.62, 430.24 and 430.52. So we have two one and a half horsepowers at 6 amps each or 12 amp total. We have one seven and a half horsepower at 22 amps each. So 22 amps for that. And we have one 10 horsepower at 20 amp, 28 amps, which we multiply by 250%, giving, giving us 70 amps. Adding all those amps, we have a total of 104 amps. So the main motor feeder protection should consist of a 100 amp switch having 100 amp fuses. These fuses should be the time delay type. Continuing with the steps, step 4, determine the lighting load. We have 26,000 VAs divided by 240 volts. We have an equal of 108.7 amps. For this we use 2 AWG copper THW or 3 AWG THHN conductors in 1 and a quarter inch conduits and we provide feeder protection consisting of 200 amp switch with 110 amp fuses in each hot leg or each current conduct uh, current carrying conductor. Step 5 find the combined feeder load. Note that the th that of the three main feeder conductors, two will carry both the motor and the lighting loads while one conductor will carry only a motor load. The two phase conductors carrying the combined motor and lighting load will need a minimum current capacity consisting of and you can see the addition of 69 amps for the motor load plus 108.7 amps for the lighting load giving us a total of 177.7 amps each of these phase conductors must be adequately sized. In this case, 3 out AWG THW is best suited. The remaining phase conductor serves only the motor load and will need a capacity equal to 69 amps. A 4 AWG TW or THW conductor will be adequate. The neutral for the lighting load must be rated to carry the maximum imbalance between it and the hot leg or 108.7 amps. 
So use a 2AWG THW or 3AWG THHN conductor. For this, refer to NEC table 310.16. The four main feeder conductors, 2 oct AWG THHN, 1 4 oct AWG THW, and 1 2 oct AWG THW should be run in 2 inch conduit. This is within the NEC Chapter 9, Table 1 Guidelines. Finally, Step 6, size the combined feeder switch and overcurrent devices. Since two, since two of the face conductors will carry a 177.7 amp load and the other a 69 amp load the main feeder switch should be rated at 200 amps the overcurrent protection for the face conductors carrying both the lighting and the motor loads will be sized at 225 amps per NEC 430.63 we add the motor current draw which is 104 amps the lighting current draw which is 108.7 amps which gives us a total of 212.7 amps and the next higher fuse rating is 225 amps a fuse or breaker supplying 110 amps of overcurrent protection must be used for the hot leg that carries only the motor load 104 amps Insulation systems for small motors. Four insulation systems are available for small induction motors. They are as follows System A or System Class A. The maximum hot spot or continuous temperature is 105 degrees centigrade. Class B, maximum. Continuous temperature is 130 degrees centigrade. Class F, 155 degrees centigrade. Class H, 180 degrees centigrade. Temperature limits are established by two agencies, the Underwriters Laboratories, as you can see on the screen. This organization protects against fire hazards. And the National Electrical Manufacturers Association, or NEMA. One of the duties of this association is to create standards to ensure adequate motor life. The nameplate data generally gives the allowable or maximum temperature rise above the ambient air for motor operation. If these are observed, the hotspot temperature of the motor should remain within the specified value for the insulation system used. The normal maximum ambient temperature is 40 degrees centigrade or 104 degrees Fahrenheit for most motor ratings. Motor installation tips. Proper installation of an electrical motor is essential for satisfactory operation, maximum service, and personal safety. The installation and wiring should conform to the recommendations of the National Electrical Code, NEC, and to any local code. Some of the causes for motor failure are moisture, bearing failure, starting mechanism failure preventing maintenance and proper motor loading are the best insurances against motor failure motor life is prolonged by keeping the motor cool dry clean and lubricated overheating Heat is one of the most destructive agents and can cause premature motor failure. Overheating occurs because of motor overloading, low voltage at the motor terminals, excessive ambient temper temperatures, 
or poor cooling because caused by accumulation of dirt or lack of ventilation. If heat is not dissipated, insulation failure can result, ruining the motor. Moisture. Moisture could be kept from entering a motor, cover the motor to protect it from the weather, particularly during periods when it is not used. Bearing failure. Bearings should be kept properly lubricated. Bearings may seize in unused motors that are not rotated for extended periods. Special care in lubrication may be required for these motors. Starting mechanism failures. Choosing a well-built motor will help solve this problem. The starting mechanism as well as the bearings and motor windings must be kept free of dirt and moisture. Mounting. Secure mounting and correct alignment with the load are essential for proper motor performance. The motor should be positioned where it is readily accessible but not in the way. If possible the motor should be located so that it will not be exposed to excessive moisture, dust or abrasive material. Mount the motor on a smooth solid foundation, fasten the mounting bolts tightly. If mounted on an uneven base or fastened insecurely, the motor may become misaligned with the load during operation. This will exert unnecessary strain on the frame and bearings, causing rapid wear and overheating. Loose mounting also causes vibration and noise. Connecting the load. Connecting the load. Motors may be connected to the load by direct drive, a chain and sprockets, or belts and pulleys. A direct drive uses a coupling to connect the shaft of the ro of the motor to the driving shaft. In this configuration, the motor and the driving equipment operate at the same speed. The motor and shaft. The motor and the motor shaft and driven shaft should be in near perfect alignment to prevent excessive wear of the shaft bearings. A flexible coupling is often used to compensate for any for any for any misalignment. A chain drive is used when high amount of torque is needed or required as the speed of the load must be different than the rotor speed or the motor speed. The desired load speed is achieved by selecting the proper combination of sprocket sizes. Maintenance of the chain drive includes lubrication of the chain, adjustment of the chain tension and inspection of the chain link for wear. The most common connection between a motor and a load is a belt and pulleys. Using a V-belt is the easiest and most common way of connecting a motor to a load. The proper belt tension must be maintained. If a belt is too loose, it will slip on the drive, pulley, overhead, overheat and wear out quickly. If it is too tight, it will cause the belt and bearing to wear excessively. To proper tension, a V-belt drive measure the length of the belt span as shown in the figure 18-12. The force required to deflect the belt is 1 64th inch for each inch of span should the, sh which should be within the values shown in the table. There are tension gauges available that are designed specifically for tensioning V-belts. Follow the manufacturer's instructions that are packaged with the gauge. Service and repair of motors. Generally, motors should not be allowed to restart automatically after a loss of power. If automatic operation is necessary, provision should be made for random restarting to prevent the excessive voltage drop in the wiring that would occur if all motors came on at one time. This can be accomplished by including 
a low cost time delay relay in the magnetic rotor starter control as shown in figure 18-13. This random restart feature is especially desirable for large horsepower motors. Figure 18-14 describes a wiring diagram and an elementary diagram. Knowing how to read these diagrams will help you diagnose problems and make the connections correctly. The diagrams for single phase motors are similar to those created for three phase motors. Counting the number of terminals on the motor or the number of legs in the power supply will help you determine the phase of the diagram. There are many details in the wiring and elementary diagrams as shown in figure 18-16. Various types of starter enclosures and their applications are found and are shown in figure 18-17. A well-made and properly installed electric motor requires less maintenance than any other types of electrical equipment. However, for the best and most economical performance, periodic services is required. The service operations listed should be performed once a year or more often if the motor operates under conditions of severe heat, cold, or dust. Motor operation, motor, motor service operations. Step one is to remove dust and dirt from the air passages and cooling surfaces of the motor to ensure proper cooling. Plugged air passages of a open motor or a coating of dust on a totally enclosed motor will cause the motor to overheat under normal operation. Step two, check bearings for wear, excessive side or end play may cause the motor to draw higher than normal starting current develops less starting torque. Again, excessive side and end play may cause the motor to draw higher than normal starting current to develop less starting torque and therefore damage the motor. Step three, make sure the motor shafts turns freely. A tight or misaligned bearing will cause the motor to overheat. Lubricate the motor according to the manufacturer's specifications. Do not over lubricate. Four, check all wiring for frayed and or bare spots. Repair or replace as needed. Six, clean the starting switch contacts of split phase and capacitor motors and the commutator and brushes in wound rotor, repulsion type motors. Use very fine sandpaper, not emery cloth. 7. Replace worn brushes and make sure the brush lifting and shorting ring action works smoothly in wound rotor motors. Step 8. Check belt pulleys to be sure they are secure on their shafts. Align the belts and pulleys carefully. Improper alignment causes excessive wear on belts and pulleys. Check and adjust belt tension and replace belts that are badly worn. And finally, the review questions for the chapter. Number one, for proper performance, the motor voltage and the frequency at the name plates must match the values specified by the manufacturer as closely as possible. Question two, true or false, low voltage from an inadequate wiring can cause problems in an electric motor, that is true. Question three, list the information which is usually, which usually appears on the nameplate attached to an electric motor.
and that is frame and type, horsepower, motor code, cycles in hertz, phase, revolutions per minute or RPM, voltage, thermal protection, amps or amperage, time, ambient temperature or temperature rise, service factor, insulation class, and NEMA design. Question 4. Explain how frame number of an electric motor helps with the standardization of electric motors. And that is most motors or motors of a given horsepower rating are built in a certain size or of frame or housing. For standardization, NEMA has assigned a frame number to the frame size for each integral horsepower motor. This ensures that the shaft heights and the dimensions are consistent for motors that are assigned a specific frame number. Question 5 lists the four common motor circuits and those are single motor circuits, multiple motor circuits, motor and other loads circuits and hermetic compressor motor circuits. Question 6. The NEC requires that the feeder capacity of a single motor circuit be 125% of the full load current rating of the motor. Question 7. What is the full load current of each of the following squirrel cage motors? For this, refer to tables in Article 430 of the NEC. And tables that you must refer are 430.248 and 430.249 of the 2011 NEC and you would see that for a single phase 10 horsepower motor you would need a 100 amp for a single phase 240 amp 240 volts 10 horsepower motor you would need it would have a 50 amp full load current for a 20 horsepower 240 volt it would have a 47 full load amp current for a 480 volt 10 horsepower 12 full amp currents for a 20 volt for a 20 horse horsepower 23 full load amps for a 40 horsepower, 45 full load amps, and for a 50 horsepower, 56 full load amps. Question 8. A motor starter is a switch or other device normally used for starting and stopping a motor. Another answer for that could be a motor con controller. Motor controller. Question 9. Study the illustration and determine A. The full load current of the electric motor and for a 7.5 horsepower scroll cage motor. Looking at table 430.249 we find that it is a 90, uh, excuse me, a 19 full load amp current motor. Part B of question 9. Correct size of conductors to keep voltage drop within the NEC set limits. The NEC set limit is 3% or 7 volts. And to calculate the correct wire size to account for voltage drop in this branch circuit, we use the following formula. I know this is a bit different from what the text just described, but I believe it is a bit more straightforward and you can acquire the same result. For this we use a formula for circular mills which is a measure of the 
uh, cross section of a cable or wire or conductor and that is equal to the K or DC wire constant times your distance one way in foot or feet times your current or full load current or full full load amps times two for a single for a uh, single phase system if it was for a three phase system it would be times 1.783 and we take all that and divide it by your voltage drop which in this case is seven volts here we have substituted each of the uh, var variables with its appropriate uh, amount or its appropriate value for the DC constant we have 12.9 which is the constant for copper we have a one-way distance of 250 feet you have to multiply that and multiply also by your full load amps or full load currents which is 19 amps and you multiply that by 2 for a single phase system which is this system here we multiply all those we get 122,550 and we divide by 7 volts we get 17,570 excuse me 17,507 and if we looked at uh, the circular mill value at table 8 chapter 9 of the NEC we find that it is in between AWG 8 and AWG 6 and we go with the larger size always of 6 AWG Question 10, list all of the following that are causes for overheating of an electric motor and all of these are causes except for D which is arguably another cause but it was not discussed in the text so it was not selected A, B, C, E, F and G Question 11, true or false, during period or periodic motor service, bearings should be lubricated, of course, true. And 12, emery cloth should not be used to clean contacts of split face and capacitor motors and the commutator and brushes of wound rotor motors. Moving on to the know the code section, name the NEC tables that lists the code letters for, mo for motor input with locked rotor. That would be table 430.7B. Question 2, section 430.32 covers continuous duty motors. Question 3, according to the section 430.109B, the OCPD shall be permitted to serve as the the answer is disconnecting means. This concludes this chapter or uh, set of chapters, chapters 17 and 18. Very, very important and critical chapters especially the one on motors make sure you understand each and every section each and every concept covered here if not go ahead and revisit review and practice uh, many problems that may be available either in this text or other texts online or at your library 
congratulations you've completed the preceding lessons from these uh, series the electrician program the program in this these couple of chapters was edited and narrated by myself Hector Bello the material was from the text modern residential wiring 9th edition by H.N. Halsman 2011 all material is edited for this video format for educational purposes only prepared and published in 2018 by myself Hector Bello thank you very much